My name is Caroline Joyner. I'm the executive director of TechNet. TechNet is a national bipartisan network of innovation economy CEOs and senior execs. We work here in Texas, in Washington, D.C., and in capitals across the country to advocate for public policy that allows uh, innovators uh, to continue to innovate and um, for the innovation economy to continue to grow. And I'm uh, Joel Trammell. Uh, I guess I've been here long enough to be a longtime serial entrepreneur, uh, now CEO of a company called Chorus, former uh, chairman of the Austin Technology Council. So we're supposed to be having a conversation about uh, how, in, how innovation in Austin is happening. So we know that we, there are innovators and entrepreneurs across the country really driving us toward unprecedented change in transportation um, options. But for those innovations to happen, entrepreneurs really need a green light from policymakers to take some risks, especially when we're coming up against uh, an incumbent. And so uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, has the recent rideshare debate here in, in Austin signaled entrepreneurs and investors more with a red light in Austin? Well, I think it's done several things. I think first it made many entrepreneurs aware, maybe for the first time, that uh, the uh, hazards in doing in a different industry. I think entrepreneurs naturally think if they build a better mousetrap, people will beat a path to their door. And there's certainly a lot of literature around product market fit and how to do those things technically. Um, but then you find out in some cases uh, that uh, that's not enough, right? There are other interests, other stakeholders who have a say politicians that have a say, and, and so that's very difficult. So I think a lot of the tech community hadn't experienced that. If they've been in the internet space or other areas that are much less regulated, they weren't aware of that. So I think it brought that awareness. I think it did, unfortunately, if you talk to people around the country, a lot of people are aware that Austin, uh, you know, rejected to, to some extent, or the, the, the view is rejected Uber and Lyft, and therefore may not be open to other technologies that are coming down the road you know obviously driverless cars are are coming down the road soon and then you know i'm sitting and watching hbo westworld the other day the first episode that was really good uh, by the way and and you know robots aren't far behind right and so what are we going to regulate there and so there are a lot of issues that uh, tech folks are going to have to deal with as we were discussing government that's don't, don't like surprises so i think there is uh, a growing need for the entrepreneurs in the tech community to educate and have some transparency around what they're doing so that governments can anticipate and clear some, some of those roadblocks away. What do you think the industry needs to do better to have some transparency and engagement with policymakers? Yeah, I think now, at least in some of the areas, people are aware they do need to start that conversation early. Uh, and it's no different, you know, I've been one preaching to startups for a long time that you need to build a balanced business. and in the you know, maybe less regulated world, that often meant adding HR and accounting and these kind of ancillary services to your business earlier rather than later. Uh, and I think you see the same thing in this area. I think, you know, governmental relations, public relations, and uh, in, in now with the social media as well, where you have chances to really ruin your business in a few minutes, uh, whereas it used to take days or weeks or years to, to have the same impact. So I think, you know, entrepreneurs have to be aware that these are other parts of the ecosystem that they have to prepare for, probably hire for, probably support organizations that can help them in these areas, because typically the young entrepreneur is not going to have the connections. Uh, they may be really smart, they may have great uh, technical chops, but you know politics and, and social policy and these things are about connections, who you know, and long relationships and those kind of things that entrepreneurs are less likely to have developed, or especially early in their careers. And part of those developing those relationships is explaining what you're doing. I think what was what was lost in the Prop One rideshare debate became a safety or no safety. And what was lost in that in those discussions were the uh, unprecedented and inherent safety features that were built in, hardwired into the tech in the technology. And I think that was uh, we we could have done a better job of explaining that and, and focusing on that. Um, but a lot of that is just a, an education gap. Yeah, you, you certainly, I mean, it would be great to know of the voters that voted on that Prop 1 issue, how many had ever even used uh, one of the applications. And so did they really know, you know, what they were voting on or was it just become a big, uh, you know, red team, blue team kind of thing, which we see often in the political discussions. But that education process, entrepreneurs naturally often want to hide their 
their innovations. They don't want to tell anybody exactly what they're doing or how they're doing it. And I think in this space, you're going to have to be much more open and honest with people about what you're doing and how you're doing it. And even the ideas of algorithms that are, you know, black boxes behind the, the scenes or, or the, these are the kind of things that scare people that don't like change. You uh, spend a lot of time um, educating and engaging with, with CEOs. How does the role of the CEO change, especially in a disruptive industry? Yeah, so the, you know, the CEO is the face uh, of the company. And, uh, and so the CEO is, is the one who's really going to be responsible for getting out and, and making sure that the perception uh, matches reality in a lot of cases. I think, as you said, with Prop 1, I'm not sure the perception matched the reality. And that is one of the CEO's job, to externally market. And, and really, the CEO's often the only one in the organization that can really represent the company. And, and we see, you know, if you look at public companies, there can be huge value placed just around the perception of the CEO. You know, I would argue, you know, part of Apple's value is the value of the CEO's brand that he's developed uh, with cert a certain constituency, and that provides a lot of value. Or, or Steve Jobs before Cook, of course, had a, had a huge value to the organization, uh, largely just a perception value. And so CEOs certainly need to look at that if they're going to play in these areas where public, uh, you know, perception matters and public policy matters, uh, you've got to think about that. So Austin, we like to call ourselves Silicon Hills and we would like to be the, the next mecca for tech. And I think, I think we're there. What does Austin need to do and Texas need to do to, to make so we can continue to drive in that direction? Yeah, we spend we spend a lot of time when I was at the Tech Council talking about you know what what Austin has. Um, you know, every area is uniquely different. Uh, depends on uh, a lot of it depends on luck. You know, the fact that uh, uh, HP happened to be formed in a garage in the San Jose uh, was, was largely just a pure case of luck. Um, you know, one of our large companies here, Dell. Uh, happened to be, you know, their expertise was really in the logistics area of the business and not so much in technology. If they had been a more technology-focused company, Austin might have developed even, even faster. And so there's some aspect of luck, but Texas certainly, you know, is attracting the talent. Every major technology producer is here, so I don't think talent's an issue. We have the major universities that drive the research. I don't think that's an issue. Uh, you know, capital has been the one area where just based, again, on some s sort of uh, arbitrary events that have occurred we have not been we don't I think get our fair share of capital certainly in Austin and maybe even in Texas as a whole and so that's an area that that really needs to be looked at how can we attract capital uh, to Austin uh, there's certainly a lot of money moving here I meet people almost every uh, week or two that could live anywhere in the world if they wanted to and they're they're choosing to live in Austin but we've somehow got to corral all those people together and and uh, activate them in the tech community to be effective. And how do we solve that access to capital issue? I know that's a million dollar question. Yeah, but... yeah, if I knew that, that answer, you know, I, I once talked to 46 VCs trying to raise money and struck out, so I'm probably not the right guy to, to uh, <laughs> tell you how to do that. I, I think I've had over 100 conversations with VCs and raised money from VCs at once. And I'm one of the successful ones in Austin, so I, I know how tough it is. Uh, for people to get the right capital base. And, and it, you know, I heard a, uh, somebody from out of town the other day in that industry was saying, well, you know, the, the rumor in Austin is people want to cash out early. And I went, well, when you talk to f literally 46 VCs, I had a company that had 31 consecutive quarters of double-digit year-over-year growth, a pretty good record in, no matter where you are. And we literally talked to 46 VCs and couldn't find one to raise money at two times revenue. Now, it was 2008, the world was ending, there are a lot of excuses, but in San Jose, I'd have got the deal done, and we'd have built a billion dollar public company. Instead, we couldn't get the deal done, and so somebody came along, made a good offer that was a 10x return to my investors, so I sold the company. It wasn't because I was trying to sell the company, it was because that was the best option for my stakeholders, because just the unique situation of Austin. So, as we move forward into trying to keep for recover from Prop 1, how do we bring tech and policymakers back together so that we can, regulation is never going to keep up with disruption, but how do we bring those two back together so that we can work in a constructive way so we can avoid that type of fight again? 
Yeah, you, you, sh you know, any time you have a disagreement like that, you, you've got to continue to engage. If both sides go to their corners and kind of hunker down and say, well, well I'm not going to deal with that, that's not going to be effective. We know that. And so we've got to continue to engage. We've got to find areas where we can have victories. Uh, there have to be things that both sides agree on that we can work together on. There's nothing like a couple of, even if they're very small and minor victories to build momentum, that at least we're rational people and we can work together. Uh, and so I think we've got to look for things in the technology area, maybe where we can help the city. There have got to be areas where they struggle with things that we have expertise that we can bring uh, to the table to help the city uh, solve some of their problems. And in exchange, let's have conversation about how we make it easier for entrepreneurs in this environment to be successful. Well, we expect the city's got a $700 million mobility bond, as we talked about, that has very little new roads in it, but also doesn't anticipate some of the enormous change coming our way with driverless cars, connected cars, electric vehicles. How, how do we get governments to start thinking? And I know Austin was pretty forward thinking on their Smart Cities initiative, but how do we continue to push in that direction, especially as it relates to transportation? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I tell, you know, every politician that I talk to is you realize in 10 years you won't be driving cars. And they look at you and say, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. I say, no, I, I don't, you know, I mean, I, I could be off a year or two, but no, in 10 years, you know, large segments of the roads will be off limits to anything but a driverless car. I absolutely believe that. I think any technologist who studies the issue believes that. And so why don't we act now to make that easier? Why don't, you know, Pittsburgh's done a great job in attracting uh, driverless car technology because they basically said, you know, what do we need to do to make it better uh, for you to operate in Pittsburgh? I, I'd love to see Austin do that. Maybe we missed the driverless car thing. Maybe it's the drones is the next one. Uh, or maybe it's robotics or whatever is the next one, but there, there are things we can do to attract those kind of initiatives, and they tend to cluster. Um, you know, you don't get it evenly spread out around the country in all the tech centers with one company. You tend to get four or five companies in the same area because once you develop the expertise, you know, those people then want to quit and start their own thing, and so you end up with a cluster of companies and expertise in areas. It was Silicon Hills 20 years ago when I moved here, uh, you know, uh, uh, micro uh, semiconductor manufacturing was our cluster technology. That's become less interesting, uh, and now we we really I think do need to find what our next cluster is going to be that we develop here in Austin. And what role does the university play in that? Yeah, universities in general. I mean, broadly, not just the University of Texas for all the Longhorn fans, uh, but uh, you know, universities. <laughs> Universities in general, there are other schools in the state that are that are reasonably uh, good, uh, uh, you know, and uh, so and and we have a large number of uh, universities that produce top talent, and uh, that's a big piece of it, uh, certainly, and uh, and so we, we do you know those we do need to participate now. You know, technology commercialization is one of those problems that none of the universities really in the world have figured out. I mean, Stanford's probably done it better than anybody else but they're still not good at it any, by any stretch of the imagination. That's been a very tough problem to solve. Uh, but we certainly can leverage the universities for a lot of what they have. Thanks. I think we've